It is uh, just after 4 a.m. in the morning on February 22nd, 1945, on the Wendling Air Base in Norfolk in England. John McCormick is watching the morning sky in the east and you can see the first rays of light behind the horizon. Another day, another mission. John McCormick has a few rituals, and one of them that is going to confession. There's a small chapel on Wendling Air Base, and John goes to confession, together with his buddy John Lingo, best friends, done all their missions together. When they exit the church, when they exit the chapel, they walk right into Joe Walker. Nickname of Joe Walker, Big Dog. Not only because he had a big dog in the airbase, but mostly because, uh, well, he behaved like, let's say his social skills were not that developed. Um, Joe Walker. <laughs> and he immediately talks to the two Johns. He said, okay, you're mine. We're flying together. I'm your pilot, so prepare. It's a strange mission today. John was briefed and, and heard all about it, and they. It's called Operation Clarion. It's huge, 1,400 planes. <laughs> wow, they're gonna, they're gonna bomb the Huns out of the war. The war is going well, yeah, for the Americans and, and for the Allied forces. It's going really, really well, and this will be the final strike. They're gonna bomb. Uh, railway stations. They're going to bomb all these significant spots that will help Montgomery to power through. 1,400 planes. It's a mixed crew. John is doing, John McCormick is doing everything as, as he's, he knows he has to do. It's, it's routine. All his routines. They, they wash the bombs. <laughs> yeah. Any small piece of mud could put them out of, out of their target. No, they have to be clean. So they clean the bombs and they load the airplanes and everybody is busy and everybody's loading planes, putting on gear and doing all the steps and all the protocols. It's a busy morning. They're going to lift off 8.30. But it's a strange mission. They have to go from, from the normal 18,000 foot to 4,000 foot to drop the bombs at low altitude because they don't want any civil, they don't want casualties, no, no civilians. But that will bring them within range of, of the German flag, the German flag that will be shot at. But okay, hey. Nobody messes with John McCormick. He's, <laughs> one time he has already, a, a few missions early, he, he, he came back at Wendling with 30 bullet holes in the plane. Oh yeah, he and John Lingo, they, they, they have been in a hospital for months on Wendling because they were injured from another, another mission, another crash. No, 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 nobody's, nobody's messing with John McCormick. <laughs> he looks at his buddy John Lingo, he's smoking a cigarette against all protocol. John McCormick walks through the, through the brick pile at, at a bit of the side of Wendling. There's a brick pile with all these loose stones and bricks, and he takes one and puts it in his gear. Another tradition. And then everything's set, and they get into their airplane, and everybody lifts up all these planes, 1,400 planes, three layers of planes. It's an amazing sight. It's powerful. It's mighty. And when the guys, when they're so close that they can see each other in, in, in their positions, they give peace signs and they make jokes. And he's, John is sitting with his back to, to John Lingle, his best friend, and they make jokes and they sing songs and uh, the leather the cowboy with only two hairs on his chest. And, <laughs> and then they, they go over the North Sea and they see the coastline of the Netherlands below, and they see some, some flag exploding way, way below them. No, they're safe from this altitude. It's freezingly cold up here. Oh, man, it's so cold. And he has, he has, his gloves are electrically warmed, so 
It's color as well, but it's extremely cold. He has, as he has taught, he has, has rubbed his face mask with salt to prevent freezing. But, oh man, it's the long wait. He sometimes called it. It's the long wait. They have to go to Nordheim to bomb this, this train station. It's the long wait. He's glad. He, he, John McCormick is glad that he's with, with John Lingo because he doesn't know any, any other guy in the crew. Well, he, know, he knows his pilot, Joe Walker, by reputation. He also knows Alma Jure by reputation. He's the, he's the tail gunner. So he has the, he has the machine gun in, in the tail of the plane. Yeah, everybody knew Elmer at Wendling. Everybody knew Elmer. Yeah, he was the, the clown of Wendling. Most people knew, and, and John vaguely knew, uh, Cass Stevens, the co-pilot. Because he helped him when he, was, uh, when he was on his first missions and didn't know... Well, Cass Stevens was a friendly guy, a tall guy, one of the tallest of Wendling. But he had only John Lingo to talk to and make jokes. He, he didn't know the other guys. Two of them, two of them were new. It was their first mission. Nagel, Hicks. <laughs> yeah, it was the end of the war, you know. A lot of these mixed crews, it, it, it was normal now. It's a long wait. And then on the intercom, the, the sign that, and John is feeling that the airplane is going down. And they breach the clouds and then chaos chaos everywhere noise of the of the flag and it, it explodes all around them first below them then on, on both sides of the plane it's pink not a lot of people notice it, it explodes in pink and in black they call it pink lace panties flag yeah they call it jokingly when they're back in wendling but there's no time to joke now there's noise there's this the smell of gunpowder fills the plane it, it oh, it's hard to breathe John holds his, his machine gun and looks for something to shoot at. And when there is something to shoot at, he will. But the plane gets hit very bad. It, like grenades exploding holes into the plane. The aluminum is... The wind rages through the plane. It's, it's all these sounds and it's such a chaos that John even misses the moment that the bombs are released by Donahue. Donnie is the guy, is, is the, 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 the one responsible for the bombing and, and the, for, the, for the hatches to open. The bombs drop and eat. Normally you feel this, this bit of a lift off when this big load is, 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 is lifted. John misses it completely. It's such a chaos and noise and sound and oh, the gunpowder, it fills the entire plane. It's shaking all over. And in split second, John gets his brick. He throws it through the bomb doors before, just before they close. His tradition. In split second, he thinks about it. He throws his brick. First time he did it, John Lingle, his best friend, he asked, what the hell are you doing? He said, well, I'll hit something. Yeah, tradition. <sighs> the plane lifts. But it's shaking in a weird way, not normal. Like, not like it's normally shaking. And there's a, there's a rattle in the plane. Strange sound that, nev that was never there. The plane is hurt. It, well, John has seen it. You, you can see through the hide. You can see through the aluminum of the, uh, of the plane. You can look outside. John looks at one of the engines and there's oil or kerosene on the wings. On the left wing, engine three is, is, smoke is coming out of it. It's burning. They've lost engine three. And then the fire extinguisher is on, the fire is, is, is out, and, but the engine is out as well. And the plane is shaking and, and rattling in, in, in an unnatural way. <laughs> and all these, these voices on the intercom, Walker, Kiss Stevens, they're, they're, they're working their, their asses off. Navigator, everybody, on the top of their game, trying to figure out, can we make it back to Wendling? Low on fuel. Going down and going up. The 
It was so much fuel. It was madness. John McCormick remembers this morning how everybody was, was complaining about this mission. It was madness. Too dangerous, and it would take too much kerosene. Too much. Now we're in trouble. But there's not much John can do. He holds on to his position and waits it out. Listens to Walker, to Stevens, you. No time for jokes, no. Alone with his thoughts, and he thinks of his mother. And all of a sudden, son, all of a sudden, John hears, hears the bolero by Ravel. John's memory drifts off to Washington, D.C. Just a few days before he went to Europe, he visited Dorothy Phillips. <laughs> His first kiss, Dorothy Phillips. He he'd called her mother to find out where she was, and she was working for the war in Washington, D.C., and he got her address, and they... They met at the Potomac River, listening to a small orchestra playing the Bolero by Ravel. They were sitting side by side and holding hands. And oh man, it was a beautiful night. Later that night, he said his goodbyes and he explained to Dorothy that he was going to Europe. They might never see each other again or at least not for a long time, because he, he will return. And, and then John had given her his, his mother's necklace with gold and a blue stone in it. And he had pressed it in her hand and said, okay, if, if I make it back, I'll, I'll replace it for something else, for another piece of jewelry. And, oh man, he just, he hoped he'd explained it well. He was going to marry her. And when the war was over, she was going to be his wife. Then the voices on the intercom, they get back. And for what John understands, there's no hope in, in making England. <laughs> they lost another engine. And the, the, the navigator, he had made a mistake. He thought that the Zuider Zee, the South Sea, was the North Sea. And they're way too far. So Joe Walker decides to make a crash landing. John Lingon and John McCormick do as they are told. They throw everything they can miss out of the airplane. You know, ammunition, anything. That the plane has to be as light as possible to survive the landing. Landing on water was, was not an option. They could not take the risk of going to England and, and crashing in the North Sea just a few miles out of the coast. The B-24 did not go well landing on water. They threw everything out of the plane, the, everything they could miss. And then they braced themselves. John knew the routine, he knew his position. Oh man, the plane was shaking all over was making noises. The plane was, was dying. You could hear it. She was screaming. Shaking all over. The noise was almost unbearable. John felt how the, how the plane was going lower and lower. There's no possibility to look outside. He didn't even want to look outside. Just brace for impact. Then... He feels the plane turning, making a short turn to land against the wind. He hears Joe Walker in the intercom say that those of you who want to, please pray. Then he gives the order to fire a, the, 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 the red lantern, the fireworks, as to say we surrender. And the light bullet is fired and they go lower. The plane is 
shaking undescribably. It's John tries to focus on the impact. Then, then they hit. They hit so hard that the whole plane is shaking. In a way, it never John has never experienced a bam like this. And the plane is shifting. It's falling. And then he hears the sound of, of metal tearing apart. He hears glass shattering. He gets thrown out of position and everything gets black. His face is bloody. His eyebrow is bleeding like hell. But he's out. He's outside. Somehow he made it outside. He's looking around. He, he sees the plane not only crashed, but <laughs> it goes into the meadow they are in. It's, the wheels are spread out to the side. The cockpit is its broken off completely. He hears Walker screaming and cursing to get him out. He does a quick head count and he sees that now as soon as Walker is out, there's, there's nine guys. Nine. <laughs> they all lived. They all survived. He sees a priest. He sees people coming out of the farm that they just barely missed with their wings. He sees the, the top of the trees has been cut off by the, the plane of, of, of the wing of the plane. He sees a few children. There's no time. There is no time to think about anything. Just follow orders now. They survived. A walker artist to throw away the logbook and, and all the codes and, and, and there's a small canal and the plane is with, with the cockpit is in the canal and they throw everything in it and they put out their overalls and they strip themselves of everything that makes them look like an American, an American soldier. Anything. His rifle, his parachute, his overall, his gear, everything. Now John looks like a normal man. Without a gun. And then Walker makes groups and he tells that they have to leave as, as fast as possible and have to split up to spread their chances of survival. No way the Germans missed this, you know. They made so much smoke and so much noise and they flew so low. Everybody has seen, they've seen the, the, the missile being fired. No, they, they know they crashed. They will be here soon. They have to split up. A walker makes groups. He, he will leave with co-pilot Stevens and Nagel and Hicks. They will go and John Lingle will go with, uh, with Harold Shea. And um, Donahue will leave with Alma Dürer and, and John is alone. He will go alone. John Lingo, he's, he's limping. Like an old man. Broken ankle. But he'll manage. He'll live. Of course he will. Just a fracture, you know. <laughs> the best friends, they, they say their goodbye. And I don't know what they said. I, I think they, they didn't say that much. Friends don't have to, you know. We'll meet again. They split up and John leaves... Uh, bit eastwards and because there's a small barn there's a small shed there and he tries to find shelter there and it's, it's not a good place and then he uh well the thing is uh from here on we don't know exactly what john mccormick did we know one thing later that night he 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 went to a small mill that was standing on one of the dikes and he asked for direction to Rotterdam. 
a city of which they knew was already liberated or, or was at least not liberated but close to the liberated part of the Netherlands. If you could cross the river at Rotterdam, you, you are safe. And, and the two people that opened the door, they showed him directions and he had to follow a certain dike and, and go south from there. And what I think happened is that John was sitting there in this landscape of, of green meadows and dikes and canals and everything looked alike. There was no place you could hide, nowhere. So I believe he used the cover of these dikes to stay out of sight. And I think he saw four of his, without knowing that it were them, he saw four of his crew members. Johnny Lingle, he couldn't walk. He had a broken ankle. He was limping. Shea was helping him, but they didn't get far. And Nagel and Hicks had seen this and got to their aid. And the four of them, they made it to a small bridge and were already captured by a German soldier. They were taken prisoner of war. And late, only a few hours after the crash, they were taken on a cart to a bunker in the park. And I think that road goes straight through the meadow that John was fleeing in, and I, I think he has, he has seen them. That he tried to hide and tried to stay out of sight, but we don't know. What we do know is that he asked for direction later that night, and what we do know is that three days later, a farmer called Lane Dochterum, the, the man, he goes to his haystack and he puts his pitchfork in it, and, and two pale white hands come out and then the head of of an American soldier and a farmer says oh no need no rain which translates as oh god not another one because just the other day they'd handed over Walker and Stevens to the resistance <laughs> not another one at the same farm the man, he doesn't know any English. He tells John McCormick to so a blijf, blijf, which means stay, and tries to tell him to stay in the haystack until it gets dark. And John understands. He goes back into the hay. And, uh, he must have been so cold. He must have been so hungry. Disorientated. I think John has never felt this vulnerable in his life. In this country where Dutch sounds exactly the same as German, at least to an American. He couldn't, he, he couldn't know who was friend and who was enemy. He had no gun. He must have felt so, so vulnerable. And I think he just, he just went in hiding in the haystack of Dochterum. And th then it gets dark and... He's taken out and he's taken to the farm and he gets something to eat, some bread and a little bit of milk. And he drinks and he eats like, <laughs> well, he, ha he hadn't eaten in three days. So <laughs> later the wife of the farmer would say that she had never seen a young man ate that much in such a short time. And then he's taken upstairs and John McCormick gets a bed that is so soft and so clean and so fresh. It's the best bed he, he has laid in in two years. But yet he, he can't sleep. He can't take his rest. He hears voices inside the house. He doesn't know Dutch from German. He can't sleep. He hears the kids at night. And the next morning, John McCormick is introduced to... Uh, to a guy who, who doesn't speak English, but John can hear that he is, well, somebody taught him what to say in English. And he introduces himself as somebody of the resistance and that they will take him to, to a hideout, to a safe house, and that he has to come and, and they dress him up like a Dutch farmer, like to, to look as a Dutchman, you know, in an overall probably, and maybe wooden shoes and... 
dressed up to look Dutch, as Dutch as possible. And then they take him outside and they put him on a bike. Well, John knew bikes. He had seen them on the airbase in Wendling. Yeah, he knew bikes, but <laughs> he'd never rode a bike. No. Now, we, we Dutch people, they, they say we are born with a bike between our legs. It's normal for us, but for an American in the 1940s, you'd <laughs> Oh, he had seen people ride a bike. You know, the English, they, they, they took them to, to go to the pubs and the bars, and, you know, outside protocol, of course, but to, to sneak out, to sneak out Wendling. He'd seen them ride bikes, of course, but he didn't know how to ride a bike, and it had wooden tires. It's the hardest bike to ride. <laughs> so they practiced. They used uh, the, 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 the front part of the garden of that, of that, of that farm, and they made a few turns and well, they practiced just as long as it, it took John McCormick to not fall off every minute and to, well, make it not stand out and at least make it realistic that he could ride a thing like that. John did everything he could. He tried to learn it and, and okay, when he, when he had found his balance, they, they headed off. He thanked the farmers and, and they left. And they had, made a, they had made a deal that the, the sister of the man that introduced him, himself, she would ride in front of them. And when there was something, uh, uh, when there were Germans and when there were the soldiers, or there was some sort of trouble, she would get off her bike and, and check her, her rear tire. That was the deal. That was the, the arrangement they made. And like I said before, John must have felt so vulnerable because she remembers an anecdote in which she said John McCormick dropped his bike and rushed to the bushes, panicking. And when she got finally back to him, she said, what was going on? And, and she sees the mailman pass by. John had seen a uniform and freaked out, apparently. <laughs> but well, they manage. They make it to, to the safe house, which is a hunting lodge that is totally secure. It's in the middle of the woods. It's... Only a few people know it even exists, let alone that it is the hideout for the, the armed resistance. John is taken there. He, th he thanks the two really nice Dutch people that brought him there. And he's introduced to the doctor. And the doctor is the number one of the, of the armed resistance there. His name is uh, Joseph Kentgens. He's a dentist. And um, he introduces John to all the other members that are present. Um, all normal looking guys and Piet van Driel and Jacob van Rij and, and he tells because um, the doctor speaks good English and it's a relief for John and they can, have a, they can have a chat and John introduces himself to the doctor and he says okay he, he tells a bit about his missions and then the doctor tells the other guys that John McCormick has bombed Berlin and they're instant friends and that night John McCormick and the doctor, they, well, the doctor puts John in a chair and they sit face to face and the doctor looks him in the eye and he says, uh, well, now you've seen what we do. And now you have two choices. Either you, uh, well, you go in hiding and wait the war out and the way it's evolving now, you'll probably live. Or you fight. You join and you fight. And without a second of hesitation, John answers, of course I fight. That's that. John joins the small group of the armed resistance there, working. He's doing raids, he's doing actions. They steal guns, they steal uh, food stamps to, to help all the people who have people in hiding, uh, they, they do armed robberies. They, they, John participates in most of the actions. And, and another great thing that John is, is finally amongst people and that he can do something. He, he, long, 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 long time ago, what feels as a long time ago, John McCormick was a, a gun instructor at, at Harlingen in Texas. There was a gunnery school there and he he taught people to fire all kinds of guns and, and, and firearms. And, and, and now he can teach the armed resistance. 
He's teaching those guys. And he makes them do push-ups with sandbags on their shoulders. And he, he, he trains them physically like he was trained physically. And those are the good days. But most of the time, John is, is rather lonely. Only two people speak good English. And, well, not, most of the days, there's only like a few people present there. And the only thing that John finds finds... A little bit of distraction in is, is fighting over who, do, who does the dishes that day. Just the normal things. Well, sometimes there's some relief because one, there's one other house on the dike near the hunting lodge. And there lives a family with young kids. Sometimes they visit. And then John plays with, with the kids. He plays tag and he plays, oh, there's, there's, there's canals and you can fall into and there's mud. And oh, they, they play all kinds of things. Kids don't need language. That's fun. But most of the time, John is, is, is lonely. And, and we know this because some of his letters are still, well, we found them. And he describes how his life is in this hunting lodge and doing the work that he does there. And, and he writes because he found out that Two of the guys, which he by then not knows are, are, are Dürer and uh, Donahue, that they are close to him. And he writes a letter and the, and the resistance brings the letter to these two and, and the letters back. And I can actually read one of these letters for you. This is John McCormick's, so I'm going to use his words. Um, it is dated, no, the letter John got from... Johnny and Elmer was dated March 27, 1945. Well, I finally heard from you. I just got your letter yesterday. It was dated March 27. Yes, I was a little banged up. Couldn't walk very well, but now I'm fine. All trace is gone except a little scar on my forehead. I remember Walker's nose all cut up and bleeding like hell. You know, I still can't remember how the hell I even got out. Don't get too pissed off like I was, but Jerry found 600 damn gallons of gas before the spits blew her up. How about that? I get lonely as hell at time, but I shouldn't kick because I'm treated swell. But I sure miss the Chesterfields and even a damn sink would taste good. I'll do that little phone job when and if I ever hit, hit God's country. But I think we will all be home around the same time. I know the vincity of your home and I'm not too far from you. As far as the women are concerned, all I see are the wives and girls of the men here. So I'm really be all keyed up. They speak English here too, so my Dutch is no good either. What a language to even pronounce, let alone learn. I now understand that Lingel Shea and RO, which is radio operator Nagel, and E, which is engineer Hicks, walked right into a German. They didn't even run. I was thinking that the way our armies are going, they will, if not already, be home before us. Well, Elmer, Johnny, here's hoping I won't be here for a reply. Mac. A few days after this letter, um, a British Spitfire crashes near Nieuwekerk, which is a town close to uh, Zevenhuizen. Um, and the English joined the group and he John McCormick has finally some, some English people to talk with and, and soldiers to talk to who know what it is to, to be who he is. Well, that brings us to um, April 29th, 1945. Today, exactly 75 years ago, a lot of things happened that day. On that day, in Moosburg in Germany, Johnny Lingle, Alan Hicks, Francis Nagel, and Harold Shea are liberated by troops under the command of General Patton. They are no longer prisoners of war. The war is over for them. And that morning, on April 29th, the English are 
enthusiastic without control. You get into the main room of, of, of the hunting lodge and they ask John McCormick why he is not listening to the BBC. Please take a few seconds and listen. This is what they're going to do. We just heard it. They're going to drop food over Holland. Planes have, have already taken air in England to drop food. They will, they will fly low altitude and no bombs, no guns. They, they will not be shot at. They will drop crates and, and, and boxes and cartons of food to help the starving people. To help us. There will, there will be food. Operation Mana, they call it. Mana. Food from the sky. Food from the heavens. <laughs> the war must be over, right? If the Germans allow planes to fly that low and don't shoot at them, it, it's almost surrender. John goes outside and climbs the dike just enough to, to see the meadows behind it. And in his imagination, he can already see the planes. And oh man, he ate murder for a piece of chocolate, really, or bacon. Cigarettes, piece of good cheese or something, anything, bread. Yeah, but most of all chocolate. The war is over. They made it. <laughs> and then it's the afternoon of April, April 29th, 1945, around 4.30 p.m., there's a bang on the outside door. And in a silhouette, they see a German soldier, German helmet. So forth, heraus! Which in German means, get outside now. And the doctor, Dr. Kentgens, he replies and he says, Yeah, we're, ich komme gleich. I shall come immediately. But instead of opening the door to the German soldier, he turns around and he tells the guys it's trouble. They have to get the guns. It's going to be nasty. They are betrayed. They're discovered. They have to fight. And then a gunfight begins that is so severe and lasts so long. Bullets are flying all around. Germans firing from the dike into the house and the resistance fighters, they're on the front of the house and firing from the inside out. The doctor is hit almost immediately. Falls down in a, in a pool of blood. Jakob van Rij is, is the second in command. He immediately takes over command. They, they say a few words and, and John runs outside. There are civilians in the hunting lodge. They have to go out. There's a small path from the on, on the behind of, of, of the hunting lodge. If they take that path and go into the fields, they will make it. They have to keep on firing. And what I think has happened is that John thought he could get these Germans in a crossfire. That if he would fire sideways and Jakob Farai was firing from the front, they could defeat them. And they could cover these civilians, these, the, the, the wife of uh, Mr. Van Rij and it would give them time to get out. John goes outside. He walks a small path and tries to make it to the shed and tries to stay as low as possible. And then a bullet hits John McCormick in the back of his head. And he's dead. John McCormick... Born December 22nd, 1921, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Dies April 29, 1945, in Zevenhuizen, the Netherlands. Age 
dies on the day that he thought the war had ended. He dies on the day that four of his crewmates are being rescued. Age 23. Every time I tell this, I wonder, what was I doing when I was 23? Nothing, probably. Making campfire, talking to my friends. I just finished my studies. All the opportunities in the world. And every time I wonder, would I have done the same? In the same situation. I've chosen to tell the story through his eyes. And try to imagine how it must have been for him. But his story isn't over. It doesn't end with his death. There's a curious fact about, about John McCormick. And maybe this is the reason why he is still so loved and so known in my community. And the fact is that he is the only American soldier that we know of who is not buried in American soil. He's buried next to the Reformed Church on the Dorpstraat on, on, in, in my town. And this is mainly because of a Mr. McCormick, John McCormick Sr., John's father. Because the Ministry of Defense wanted John McCormick's body to return to the United States, to be buried in American soil. But John McCormick Sr., his father, he, he insisted his son's body should be buried with the people who he had spent his last days with. His body should be with his brothers in arms. Few letters back and forth. Mr. McCormick gets, when, when the Ministry of Defense finally gets his point that he wants his son's body to stay where it is, they send him a waiver in which Mr. John e, uh, Mr. McCormick had to certify that he was next of kin and that he realized that the United States government was released from any further responsibility for these remains or for perpetual care and maintenance of his grave. And he had to sign for the following I will not call upon the government of the United States at any time in the future to return said remains to the United States at government's expense. All responsibility concerning this subject will be borne by me. Mr. McCormick signed that waiver, but he added a letter to the Ministry of Defense, which has one incredibly beautiful and bone-chilling line in it that I will quote July 16th, 1947. The letter of John McCormick Sr. in which he says to put the discussion to a stop. I am unable to see any sense of reason in taking a person's body from Europe to the United States. Whereas I consider that it does not matter where a person's body is buried so long as his soul is in heaven. Mr. McCormick thanks the people of Zutomir who by then have decided to raise a monument over his grave. It's still there. And um, they've given him great honors and he really appreciates that. Um, but the Ministry of Defense only agrees if, if Mr. McCormick gives somebody the positions of, of, of an agent. Somebody has to take care, not only now, but in the, in the following years. And, uh, Dr. Kentgens, who was shot, yes, but not killed. Uh, he survived the horrible uh, uh, gunfight. And he, of course, accepts that position of agent. And this is the, we actually have this. Remains of descendant are interred in the community cemetery in Zutomir and are to be undisturbed in compliance with desires of next of kin. Agreement was made with Mr. Kentgens a dentist who acted as agent for next of kin. This is February 16th, 1950. The story still is alive. And when I 
when I told I was going to do this, I was going to tell this story, his story, on, his, on the day that he died 75 years ago. A lot of people responded, and, and I would like to mention one of these people, because he's one of the people that really is keeping the story alive. His, his name is Martin Hartenga, and he found this. And it is a piece of the plane, the actual B-24 that John McCormick was in. He did a few digs on the crash site, and he, he found this. This is live history. It's, a, it's, in, it's incredible. Um, but he also gave me this, which is even more remarkable. Uh, knowing that, and this is also how the story is alive, knowing that his family is watching. This is uh, John Lingle's uniform. And it was given to his family because John Lingle was missing in action, presumed dead. And his locker was emptied at Wendling, and this was hanging in it. This is what they used to wear at Wendling when they had free time. And this was actually worn by John Lingle. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. This was the code for the dry cleaning. It's still there. History is alive. His story is alive. I want to show you one thing more and then because this is an amazing piece of living history as well. Another person responded, it's uh, Cassandra Cummings. She works at the uh, Hangar Flight Museum in Calgary. And she gave me this picture. I hope you can see it. It's a woman in a wedding dress. And this wedding dress is made from Elmer Dewar's parachute. When they had to strip off all their gear when they had just crashed and th they gave everything away to the people that were present, his parachute was eventually given to a man called Bill van Niekerk. And Bill and his wife Wilhelmina, they married shortly after the war and suddenly remembered that there was a parachute under that bed. <laughs> there was enough fabric to make a wedding dress of. And even the, the kids even wore it for baptism. And, and it's still there at the Hangar Flight Museum in Calgary. But the last picture I want to show you is, is this. Um, because I visited his grave two weeks ago, John McCormick's grave. And the pear trees were blossoming. The two pear trees on each side of his grave. And you see the monument that is erected there for and not only John who's buried there, but also Jacob van Rij, uh, the second in command who was killed in the gunfight and also uh, two of the other resistance fighters who were killed on uh, May 5th. Um, but they were all members of the same group. They are in front of the Reformed Church. And I visited his grave two weeks ago. And bear trees were blossoming. Um, his tree is alive. I live nearby the crush side. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, how important this story still is in, in the community, in the town where I live. So, um, jollyduck.com, go and visit that website and go to the Hangar Flight Museum and go to b24.net. There's the whole John McCormick story written out. It's, it's beautiful. Look that up um, and honor these guys. Yeah. This is all I had to tell for now. And, um, there is a live chat on this YouTube stream, so if there are people who have questions, you can do that now. We have a few minutes left. If I can answer them now, um, I do that. If not, um, I'll let you know on another day and, and another time. You can send me your email and we'll be in touch. Yeah. But if you have a question now, we can do it live. We'll wait a few seconds. No questions for now. Okay, that's good. That's good. We're going to post my um, my contact in uh, in the YouTube stream. So if you have a question later, just ask, and I'll try to answer what I know. Yeah. Um, thank you all for listening. It was my first online theater experience, and I I hope that it was good to be a part of this 
um, and to hear his story again and stories of these other guys. And um, let's not forget what they did. I was certainly not. Um, so thank you for joining this and being a part of this. And um, we'll meet again somehow, somewhere. So thank you.